We have Chris Larson with us here today. Chris, I really appreciate your time. But before we kick things off, if you want to follow along, head over to nextlevelincome.com and take advantage of Chris's offer. He's giving out a book. And unlike a lot of places that I've seen, I was giving Chris a little ribbing is that he even covers the shipping and handling. So why not take advantage of this? This is That's awesome. So really appreciate your time here, Chris. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's see how many people we can get to take advantage of, of, of the book giveaway here today. Jack, really appreciate the opportunity to be on. So Chris has been in real estate investing for quite a while, since the age of 21. And now you are retired at the age of? How old am I? I'll be 44 this year, Jack. 44 this year. Before we got on the call, you mentioned you're up to 3,000 doors, about a billion dollars in assets. Yeah. So maybe I'm not quite retired. Maybe I'm still got a little bit of stuff going on in the background. Yeah. How can you not? It's addictive, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah. Putting deals together is a blast and really doing stuff like this, sharing the shortcuts with new investors, as well as experienced investors that you know just haven't had the opportunity to see different asset classes or have the same experiences is a lot of fun. You mentioned helping people get started in this. You went from $3,000 to a billion dollars in assets. I know this is probably a long story, but I need to open that can of worms. Like what, how did you go from point A to point B? Yeah, this is, this is like the perfect story. I think when it comes to the power of real estate. So I like to say what we do is, which is like mostly value add real estate. It's a lot like the Warren Buffett strategy of real estate. And I tell people it's sexy, like Warren Buffett too, which is to say, it's not super exciting. It takes a while to get started. Warren Buffett didn't, he didn't really make his real money until he was in his fifties. So it took him a long time to get up and allow compound, the magic of compounding to work. And I was fortunate. I got a slap in the face in college. I was racing my bike. I was going to Virginia Tech for engineering. And I say fortunate from a wake up call perspective, but I was unfortunate. I lost my best friend between my freshman and sophomore years of college. And it really had me become introspective and or forced me to become introspective and think, am I really getting the most out of life? And during that period, something dawned on me, which was, I want to get the most out of every day, but you need financial resources to do. So I dove into the world of stock of the stock market. I was introduced to raw, the concept of Roth IRAs in the stock market by the same family friend that got me into cycling. And by the way, I talk about this in my book as well. You can, you can dive a little bit deeper into my story, but long story short, I ended up going from trading in the stock market to buying my first real estate property over the course of about 12 to 18 months. And that first property, it was less than $3,000 down. It was a $90,000 property. It was a townhouse. And today we call it a house hack or co-living. Like I rented out two of the three bedrooms, but I took that same property 15 years later, I sold it, executed a 1031 exchange, bought a seven unit commercial property in downtown Asheville. And that was, it was on the market for about $700,000. I paid $525,000 for it. Two years later, refinanced that property um, at a value of over $800,000. So it created approximately $300,000 of equity in that property in two years from that initial $3,000 seed investment. And I was able to take out $200,000 at the time. We still own the property. I actually have a call this afternoon with a bank to do another refinance, another cash out refinance. It cash flows over $3,000 a month. So that first $3,000 down for my first property that I rented out was my first deal. But we used the exact same strategy that we did in the property in downtown. We bought a property that was a little bit in distress. We injected some capital into it. We raised rents to market rents. We improved the, the value or the building itself through capital infusion there. We do the same thing in apartments. We do the same thing in self-storage. We even do the same thing in car washes today. And that's what that same strategy, again, which I call that Warren Buffett strategy. It's not sexy, but it's repeatable. We're talking about people getting into real estate investing for the first time. Right now, you've, you have the options of a variety of different investment vehicles. Where would you say somebody should start? Is similar to you? You started in in stock and you earned up enough money in the stock market in order to buy that first single family home? Is that what you would suggest or where should they begin? Or in yeah, hindsight, so would you do anything different? I do. I would do a lot different. And again, this is the reason, Jack, that I wrote my book was is to help. Like if you're listening today, read the book. Like it could take 15 years 
off of the experience curve, off the learning curve. And I would not start where I started, but then at the same time, it would be fairly similar. So if you're starting off today, if you have yet to do your first deal or maybe have a rental property and you're looking to expand, I think two of the best options today are one fix and flip, which is buying a property, putting some cash into it. If you live in it yourself for two years, you can sell that property and take a profit of up to $250,000 tax-free. That's really sweet. That's a really, really great option. So if you can in invest $50,000 into a property and make a $100,000 profit, you're doubling your money. And then if you can do it tax-free over two years, I mean, that's awesome. If you don't have the cash to do it, find a partner. I actually partnered with my mother. And the reason is I need somebody to sign on the loan. I didn't have enough credit when I was 21 years old to to get a loan from the bank. I didn't really have a full-time job at the time. I was still in, trying to think if I was even in grad school. I was in, no, I was in undergrad at the time. So I didn't have a full-time job. I needed my mom to co-sign. So she was my partner. And my parents, we didn't have a ton of money, which is why I went and worked for a lot of years to create some capital. Another great option, and we do this today, my wife and I, we have two short-term rentals. So short-term rentals or Airbnbs, you could even take a version of that in the co-living option, which is you rent out rooms in a house and you get a premium for doing that. All of these, I think, are great options today to get started in real estate. Yeah, that, there's so many different more, there are so many options available to everybody. And I think that the house hacking that you're talking about is most commonly missed. And it usually blows people in mind when I bring up the fact that you can sometimes, you can typically get a first time home buyer qualification for a four unit plex these days. Yes. You don't have to buy an actual single family home. Yeah. No, it's, and that's great. Like the more units that you can get into, the more kind of arbitrage, if you will, opportunity there is because you can rent out all of those units. And I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic strategy and you can take advantage of some of the best rates that are out there right now, if you have it as a residential or a primary, a primary residence. Yeah. And it, it's really a good tip that you can take you can earn as much as 250,000 without being taxed on it. That, that could potentially be huge. Oh, it's listen. So the next level income strategy is how to make more money, keep more money and ultimately grow your money. So we're talking, we're already talking about growing your money, but that's a keep part of the strategy, right? If you make a hundred thousand dollars, but you have to pay $25,000 in taxes, you've only made $75,000. So you take 50 and you turn it into a hundred, but you pay 25. You've gotten, a, you've gotten a 50% rate of return. That's still really good. And you get a hundred percent rate of return. That's amazing. So yeah, you always have to go into an investment and look at the after-tax returns and make sure you're maximizing that. And you have to look at the full picture, the full spectrum of all these things. Yeah. Before we started here too, we were talking a little bit about marketing and regarding your book and your, it's no wonder that you, you give this book away because I, in fact, if you're interested in some of the projects Chris is working on, you should again, head over to his website, that next level income.com regarding this, because you have, you mentioned just here so far, multifamily, single storage units. And I've been seeing crazy amounts of these car washes popping up everywhere lately. What's what made you go from these different categories? Yeah. So I think one of the things that I talk about a lot, and actually I'm just about to release it maybe out when this episode's released our hundredth episode of the podcast, next level income, the next level income show, which is also on the website. And in it, I talk about like my thoughts and what I, where I think the future is going to be. And one of the big core tenants of trying to figure that out is understanding the real estate cycle. And if you look at where we are in the real estate cycle today, we're, we're past the mid cycle slowdown, which happened during COVID and we're in this final run up period. And the trouble with today is that real estate can be expensive. So if you're buying a residential home and trying to run it. The numbers don't make sense. A lot of times multifamily last year had the best year in the history of multifamily by any measure. You talk about rent growth, you talk about occupancy, you talk about cap rate compression, pick a number. It was an amazing year for multifamily. What else is out there? Where are other options for value creation in real estate? I think self-storage has a lot of the same demographics as multifamily, but there's still some inefficiencies out there. There's a lot of mom and pop owners. About 80% of self-storage units are owned by mom and pop small operators today. So there's some inefficiencies there. Same thing in car washes. And one of the nice things with car washes is you have the real estate component and you have the operational component. I think where we are today in the real estate cycle, it's important to have cash flow investments with reasonable leverage 
and really solid reserves. If you follow those rules, you're going to be a lot safer when the next downturn comes. But if you look at operating real estate, and I would call short-term rentals operating real estate, I would call car washes operating real estate, senior housing or assisted living facilities, these are all operating real estate with a that has a business associated with it. There's more variables, there's more risk, but there's also more opportunities to create value and efficiencies. And again, when you're working with big numbers, big portfolios, 300 door um, property, like a multifamily property, it's typical of what we buy, two, three, even over 300 units. If you do the same thing in all 300 units, you create a little bit of value across those, you can create a, a tremendous amount of wealth. Right. So you, since you brought it up, I'm really curious. Now you've been doing this for two decades. What do you see on the horizon? We got record high inflation. We're starting to see movement now on our interest rates. What, what do you see? What's coming up? Yeah. So again, I don't think what we're going through is a big surprise based upon where we are in the real estate cycle. Let me back up. And again, I would listen to episode 100 of my podcast where I dive deep into this exact topic, Jack, but real estate cycles typically go in about 18 to 19 year cycles. You hear people say nine, nine year economic cycles, take two of those, right? That's nine plus nine mm -hmm. is 18. And the first half is different than the second half. So during the first half of the cycle, you are coming out of the last real estate cycle. So the last bottom was around 2012. Okay. Last cycle topped out around 2008 and a 2008 going into 2009. Fast forward four years, you're at 2012. That's the, that was the start of the cycle. The first half, we're clearing out a lot of the bad debt. Builders are getting back on their feet. Finally, in 2013, 2014, we were able to start building spec homes because banks started lending. Like you see a lot of this start to happen. Interest rates tend to be low because people aren't borrowing. There's not a lot of credit creation. When there's a lot of credit creation, there's a lot of demand for money. Inflation is just a measure of the demand for money. Now it's a little bit perverted today because of all the Fed printing money. That's a, that's a more uh, complex topic. If you go back to the eighties, we saw the same thing. As you get later in the cycle, if you go back to 9-11, this was around the time I actually met my wife at that time. And I was still in grad school. The economy slowed down. There was a mid-cycle slowdown after 9-11. Same thing, interest rates picked up. I was paying like like 6%, I think, on our mortgages around that time. So if you mm -hmm. look at today, we still have low interest rates, but rents were picking up and then the market got crazy. So I think going forward, in, in my estimation, we probably have another three or four really solid years as the market continues on. But you have what I would call like the winner's curse during this time. And Phil Anderson talks about this in his great book called The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking, which I kind of in my, in my desk drawer, like a Bible in the, in the bedside stand here in a hotel. And he talks about the winner's curse in which there's a lot of people like, Hey, I got to buy real estate. It never goes down during this time. The numbers aren't working really well. There's a lot of speculation. So I think there's going to be some speculation here in the future. There's going to be a slowdown at some point. And we have to be, again, very cognizant of those three things that I mentioned, which are cash flow, reasonable loan to values, and having ample cash stores on the side if there is a slowdown. Sure. Before we hit record, we also mentioned the concept, even say that real estate investing is a, what did you, how did you put it? Slow to rich? Yeah, get rich slow. You know, we, get rich slow. Yeah, get rich slow because we, we were joking that we sure hear a lot of get rich quick schemes when it comes to real estate investing. Let's dive a little bit into that. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, listen, I think the financial universe has a lot of things wrong. All right. And one of the things that I disagree with is take risks early in life. And so, oh, you're young. You can take risks. Oh, you're young. Bet on some crazy investment and strike it rich. That's playing on emotion. I took the opposite approach. I said, let me pick a strategy that has a very high level of predictability. Now I was trained as an engineer, so I'm very analytical. I think, okay, if I can put a plan in place, I raced bicycles for a lot of years. So I'm a, I put these plans in place that would take me a year to execute. And I would just systematically go through them because I wanted to have a high degree of probability of success on a given event. Okay. Like the national championships or the world championships, for instance. So if you're 20 years old and you're just starting out or 30 or 40, whatever, however old you are, and you say, Hey, I want to achieve a certain level of financial success, whether it's passive income or net worth or a number of properties, whatever that metric may be, pick a strategy that over that given period of time is going to give you the highest degree of success. 
So my point is, if you start at 21 like I did, and f- about 15 years later, you've reached financial independence, then at that point, how much risk can you take? It's almost unlimited at that point. If, you're, if you start early, you develop a very specific plan, a get rich slow plan, if you will, where you can become financially independent over five, 10, 15, even 20 years, what can you do with the rest of your life, with the rest of your time, if then you have the capacity to take almost unlimited risk because your basic needs and expenses are covered? Think about that. That's how I want people to think that I speak to, the people that I coach. And that's what I mean by get rich slow. If you do it right, real estate will get you to financial independence. Some people, you may luck out, do it a little bit sooner, but make a plan that gives you a very high degree of success or probability of success over a given period of time. So you said you you do a little coaching? Yeah. So I started when I left the medical device industry where I spent 18 years of my career, really when I reflected with the coach I was working with, I said, what do I really enjoy? What if I really enjoyed over the years? And what I enjoyed was the mentorship, the training younger reps that were coming in, building teams, teaching them the shortcuts, the skills, the tips and tricks that worked for me, and then scaling and watching them achieve that success. And I love to do the same thing right now. So I have a small group that I coach one-on-one. We have a group coaching course that we're launching as well. And it's been a lot of fun, you know, watching whether it's somebody negotiate a new role for themselves where they double the amount of income they're making or buy their first property. I have a coaching client. He actually just left. It happens to be his birthday today. Happy birthday, Jake. And he has created in about a year, six figures of income from his short-term rental business. Oh, wow. Since you've been doing some of the coaching, what are some of the consistent hurdles that you've run into that you've seen time and time again? Yeah. The corollary to that to the answer to that question is what have I seen? What are those things that are associated with success? So I find that the biggest challenge that a lot of people have is lack of vision, like lack of clarity. So the first thing we do is with our coaching clients, we help them create a three-year vision and we focus on four main areas. First is health. Without your health, what's the point, right? What's the point of having wealth if you don't have health? If you have health and you can live as long as you want, you have a lot of time to do a lot of things. We focus on health first. Number two is wealth, and that is your plan for financial independence. Then we talk about your goals around your social environment, which would be your social interactions. That can be your spouse, your family, your friends, those sorts of things, and then personal enrichment as well, which is really, that ends up coming full circle back to your health and being the ultimate bedrock of your future development. So once we have a clear three-year vision, because I think a year's too short, five years is too long, three years is like the Goldilocks version, as I like to think of it. Then we put together one-year plans and quarterly plans to figure that out. But really to blow through all that, the things that work are my coaching clients that have that three-year vision. They ultimately are more successful than those that aren't, that have a hard time putting that together. And then consistency, it's the discipline. So that's the other thing. A lot of people, they, there's so much information out there, Jack. You can go on the internet and find all the information you need to achieve whatever it is you want. But what, what, what's the trouble? It's distilling that information getting clarity to figure out what information and what strategy is going to help you get to your goal. And the final piece is accountability. So that's where we put it all together. We create the vision, we create the network and the resources to help you get the right help in the right areas that you need, and then ultimately provide you that weekly accountability. So you have somebody that's there and saying, Hey, did you do this? And it's typically the things that you don't want to hear that you need to do the most. Yeah. Now, I can't echo that enough. Between, it's such an important exercise regarding, I've, I'm sure my listeners are tired of me saying it. it. Until you, unless you write it down and actually make a plan, that's when it's a target. Otherwise, it's a dream. You got to write it. You got to write it down. And yeah. then lastly is the whole consistent, pers- persistent behavior yes. will outwin every time as long as you're Love consistent. It. I also wanted to, you roundabout said too, and maybe I'm saying something that you uh, maybe, you maybe would 
agree or disagree so far we've been agreeing on like everything so i'm gonna guess so yeah let's get a little yeah let's disagree and get a little more exciting here jack let's find so, something we can so argue I, about. I find we we're talking about i'm just getting so tired of this whole get rich quick thing but yeah. i'm also getting a little tired of um there's this whole romanticism associated with the hustle and the grind mm, yeah and instead of working on things and towards the goals and I run into people all the time where they'll just say, I'm working 80 hours a week, but I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah. Well, and then when I ask them, what are you working on? It's a logo designer. It's a, it's something that doesn't have any value. It doesn't. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is, look, this is pervasive throughout our society today. We have too much. And I have this discussion with my two boys, they're 10 and 12 and they won't share. They won't maybe give you a bite of their dessert or something like that. And the answer to that in our household is you get that taken away from you because the answer to too much is less. Okay. And so let me expound upon that. We have an obesity problem in our society. It's not because we don't have the right food. People aren't healthy because they don't have the right food. It's because they have too much of the wrong food. They're consuming right. too much of the wrong food. If you go to the gym and you work out, I used to, when I was racing, the sec, the latter half of my career, I quit, I came back and I had a full-time job. I was on call for 12 years in my career. And some of those weeks I worked like a hundred hours and I'd go to races and people were like, oh man, I just can't, I can't train like you, Chris. That's why I guess I can't keep up. I was like, well, how many hours a week do you train? And they look at me and I say, I train seven hours a week. And this is from somebody that used to train 20 to even 30 hours a week. I had weeks that mm -hmm. I rode 500 miles, rode over 30 hours. And a lot of the pros that I race with, younger guys were trained over 20 hours a week. But I did the right stuff. I would just do the hard workouts and then I'd find ways to recover. Instead of going and riding my bike for five hours, I'd ride it for 75 minutes. But I would do the same workouts in those 75 minutes that say a professional rider would do in the midst of a three, four or five hour ride. And that's what it's all about. So today I took my son to school. I worked out. I had some investor communications. I had a great lunch with my wife. I'm doing this podcast. So there's not a lot of fluff in there. And I think if you focus on those things that are going to move the right levers and then ultimately you outsource the other things. And this is a stepwise progression. Like we had, we actually had a cleaner in our home today. So I could have spent six hours cleaning my house. I chose to pay somebody to do that and focus on the things that are actually going to move the needle in my business. So that's the other thing. If you're working 80 hours and you're hustling and grinding, I would question, are you doing the right things all those 80 hours? Can you cut 10 hours out? Can you cut 10 and get the same results? Okay, great. If you can do that, what can you do with those 10 hours? Maybe you can focus on one of those other three areas in your four areas of health, wealth, social, and personal and improve in that area. And then you're going to be more successful if you're healthier because you're going to be more productive. If you can cut 10 hours out, probably you can cut 20 hours out. And if you're struggling and you're saying, well, Chris, I work a full-time job, but I don't have the time, then you have to say, what are you doing with the other hours? Are you surfing social media? Take Facebook off your computer. Take Instagram off your phone. Get rid of those things. Make it hard for you to waste your time doing that. Are you a news junkie? Do you sit there and watch the news every night like I used to? Or do you get on Fox News or CNN or one of, one of these news websites and, and sit there and read through that? Cut that out. What about sports? I know a lot of people, look, I love to watch sports, especially the ones I'm interested in. But if you spend you know 10 hours on a weekend watching football and you're struggling to find 10 hours to improve your life in another area, there you go. That's the opportunity to do. Yeah, if you're hustling and grinding that many hours, chances are, there, there are opportunities for efficiency, unless you're like Elon Musk and the guys are on all these different multi-billion dollar businesses. He's probably got it figured out in some ways. I'm not saying, <laughs> I don't know if I could handle his lifestyle, but if I got that guy, hey, listen, that guy's got the same 24 hours as you and me, right? Yeah. No, when you were saying that, it reminds me of, you probably have seen that meme. I see it popping up almost on a weekly basis. It's a thousand dollars for the new iPhone. No problem. Thousand dollars for training too expensive. Can't afford it. It's, it's all regarding priorities, right? Absolutely. And listen, I've, I spend on an annual basis and I used to make on an annual basis when I first started out in my career on coaching. So I spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on coaching. And what I can tell you is I get a multiple back on that, a, a multiple on the return of my investment in that without a doubt. I still think that's a mindset shift, right? The concept that that type of training is actually another form of investment. And then, yes. frankly, I would make the argument that's one of those investments that will never leave you and only it, it can only make you better in some way. So instead of seeing it as an expense, it should be as a, seen as an investment. Oh yeah. If you think college is worth the investment, 
uh, chances are any specific coaching that's going to move the needle towards what you want to achieve in life is going to be a way better investment. I would even argue that most people that go to college today, they do not get a return on their investment better than they could get in a lot of other places. I, and I know I'm, we're coming up on 30 minutes here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of balancing this all out. You're an entrepreneur, real estate investor. You're a cyclist, a real estate investor. How do you balance all of this? Yeah, so it balances when people say, hey, I want perfect work-life balance. There's no perfect balance in life. And I think when you realize that, Jack, it helps you become more successful. If you're an a athlete, get this inherently. So if you're listening and you are an athlete or were an athlete, like you don't train super hard every day, seven days a week. You have hard days, you have easy days. You work hard, you recover. You work hard, you recover. You can apply the same thing in your life. So like I spent all weekend with my two boys. We went to lacrosse games. My older son had his first mountain bike race, which was cool because he, I've not pushed him in that direction. He's organically come to that on his own, which was fun mm -hmm. to see. I didn't, I, I maybe worked an hour this weekend. I was every Saturday morning, I do a newsletter to my coaching clients. So that went out. The rest was hundred percent dedicated to them. That wasn't work-life balance. That was life this weekend. Whereas I may record yesterday, I think I had four podcasts. That's not balance either today. I'm going to take a bike ride with my son. I got to work out in. It's a little bit different. You know, what I do is I have days where I'm very focused on certain things and blocks of time during those days that I'm very focused on certain things. And I, I take it and it's basically, if you look at filling a jar with rocks, you can put big rocks in there and then you can put some smaller rocks, like marble sized rocks in there. And then you can put pebbles in there and then you can fill it with sand. Like you, you, those big rocks that you put in there, those have to be your big priorities in your life. So as you look at your schedule, I mine up here on my computer, put those big rocks in your schedule. Then for those meetings, those daily meetings, those, maybe it's calls with your team or investor calls or coaching calls, like you put those things in there and then let the little things, oh, I got to pay this bill. I have to have this conversation with this, whatever it might be. Let those things fill up. To achieve balance, you have to one, realize that life isn't balanced. Two, figure out what your priorities are in your life that you want to fulfill you in those areas. Plug those in and then let the rest of life come in on its own. Like those little emergencies, they'll fill the space there for you. And if you got some free time, then you can surf Facebook or Instagram. No, this has been a great conversation. Again, I want to remind everybody, head over to nextlevelincome.com. Take advantage of Chris and his free book. And while you're there, you might as well check out the podcast too. But again, this is, I really appreciate your time here, Chris. But before I wrap things up here, is there a question or a concept you wish we would have covered here today? I think we've discussed all these things. I want to share that you can have it all. So a lot of people think like you have to give up certain things in your life. There's a great book called Die With Zero. And I thought if, if you read that, the concept is basically, hey, what are you like, what are you working for? Realize that life, like, like I, I realized very early on, may not be here for you tomorrow. Make sure you're experiencing things on a daily basis. So as you hustle, as you grind, as you work towards those goals and those big rocks that we were just talking about, take a little time every day, every week, for your family, for your loved ones, for yourself, and enjoy the day. Look out the window. It's beautiful spring day here today. Take a moment, enjoy that, put a smile on your face because happiness, I believe, is the true key to success. So I, I have to point this out. It's a couple of the books you've recommended here now. Oh, Die With Zero. Is that with Bill Perkins? Is that the author? Yes, yeah, Bill Perkins, yep. exactly. It's $1.99 on Kindle right now. Ooh, so. that's cheap. Hey, take advantage. It's almost right? as cheap as my book. Again, head over to Chris's website. You're right. Why not take advantage of that? Nextlevelincome.com. And this was great, Chris. I hope you'll come back again sometime. This is a, a great conversation. Anytime, Jack. I love what you do. Love your podcast. You've had some terrific guests on. And yeah, if you're listening today, you certainly have found a terrific resource. And hopefully what we talked about today can help move you towards where you want to achieve or what you want to achieve in your life.